my name is Bill Nyman, and I, uh, I'm the founder of Nyman Ranch Inc., which is a big coast to coast brand. And I left that company, which your viewers may be familiar with, but I left that company in 2007, and uh, uh, because of just changes and. Uh, I, I had a new mission, which was to really establish uh, pasture-based agriculture as the uh, future best methods, and uh, that was that became my passion. And uh, formed at that time what I, we called uh, BN Ranch, which could either stand for Bill Nyman or Bill and Nicolette's Farm, and uh, which fast forward to today, it's now Bill Nyman Farm, and Nicolette is my wife, and we live on that farm and ranch, which was the original Nyman Ranch. Uh, and we own it ourselves. We still live there and farm, and we raise beef cattle from um, a cow calf curd that, that we own and manage, as well as a, a breeding flock of heritage turkeys, which we uh, hatch and, and grow out and distribute nationally. The one number that sticks in my head, and, and it's albeit dated, uh, still, the huge number is that the cost of uh, industrial agriculture, dumping of waste in our, the air and water, and creation of antibiotic-resistant pathogens, has cost human public health thirty billion dollars annually. That number really sticks in, in in my mind, and I can't imagine what it is today, but it's got to be greater. So. Uh, and I continue to see that the, the, the situation worsening, whether you focus on antibiotic-resistant pathogens and the cost of human public health or the treatment of water for our potable water, the long-term consequences for the environment. And, and then there's the consequences for communities, whether it's farmers or rural towns or uh, areas where there are concentrated animal feeding operations just to the quality of life, whether it be the constant odor, the water degradation, air degradation, and you know social consequences that, that go along with that. So it's really kind of cheapening people's lives in, in, in ways that are you know hard to quantify and uh, difficult to apply a metric to it, but those folks that are in that pathway of that uh, really do suffer. I remember when we visited Duplin County, which is one of the kind of the epicenter of the North Carolina floodplain, the Smithfield Empire. Confinement agriculture dominates there. In order to make that work, the farmers there have really been forced to ignore the, 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 the basic needs of, of their animals. And as we were touring there, when we were talking about confining just dating, confining breeding animals in cages, that all they could do was get up and down. They couldn't turn around. They could move forward a little bit and get up and down. And they said, well, these, these pigs don't even know that they can turn around. You know, they've never had the opportunity. So like it was so insensitive to what, these really intelligent animals, more intelligent than dogs, or at least the equal of most dogs, more intelligent than my dog, I know that. And, and they're saying that they, these animals didn't know that they could turn around. And this is a way of rationalizing this factory model that they created. And that model uh, could only, that's the, the only way you could raise pigs in that geography and on that landscape could be in these tightly confined concrete facilities. And even that failed when the water table was about this high above the ground and they were all underwater. The confinement animal industry, whether it's chickens or pigs, have totally ignored the basic needs for animals and their well-being. And they can't run their businesses without doing that because they're capital intensive in operations and their the variable cost of labor is just diminished greatly so that somebody can just come in there on a nine to five basis and pull a couple of levers, push a couple of buttons and get the dead pigs out. What's, what's terrifying to me is when you talk to young to middle-aged farmers who don't, who've never looked a pig in the eye out in pasture and felt their love and exuberance for life because all they know is looking in the eyes of a 
psychotic animal in a confinement operation. They think that's the way it's supposed to be. And they genuinely, which also is frightening, they genuinely believe that they're doing the right things by the animals by providing a, a mosquito-free or temperature control environment, even though they may have to live on concrete their entire life over their manure or just live on a hard surface and not be able to do anything and get up and lie down, lie down and not turn around. So they think that's okay because, well, that's what they were taught and that's what is creating a, a business model that will support their family, uh, albeit not, not greatly, but uh, not minimally. And, and they're really kind of on this, and we have these heavily capitalized operations and are kind of uh, uh, indebted to the company store and they think this is the way it's supposed to be. It's, it is more work, you know, and there's no question about that industrial farm models are really easier to operate. I mean, ultimately, with technology, and the dream is that every farmer can get up and push a few buttons on his computer and turn his GPS on and run his farm from the kitchen table or the local coffee shop, you know, or, you know, kicking, telling lies and stories to his neighbors uh, uh, over an early breakfast. So that, that, that's, what, that's what the capital intensive, high tech, large farms are coming to, you know, $500,000 tractors and uh, uh, operating by technology, enabling one or two people to, to farm a lot of land. And the same thing is true with concentrating a large number of animals in a, in a, a confinement feeding facility. That may be not, not a, an understatement of the, or undercharacterizing this, this struggle. You know, everybody doesn't have to eat filet mignon, but you know, organ meat and braised meats are just as nutritious as filet mignon, but they have much lower. Everybody can access that. And you know, everybody needs to know when they have a chicken, a whole chicken, there's several meals there, you know. Let's not throw away the carcass. Let's make sure, you know, you start with eat the, eat the easy muscles and then cook that carcass and pull the meat off and maybe you'll have tacos or chicken salad and then you have the soup. That's how we have to start. Can you pay $20 for chicken instead of $10 or $12 and understand how to eat, feed your family for three days rather than think, oh, this is only $10. I'll pick what I want and throw the rest away, you know. That's what's happening and everybody's stable. Hey, I'm on a mission here because I think the critical control point is really the you know, harvesting. Small to medium farmers have been denied access. So, so they can raise animals, but they can't get them harvested. They can't get them slaughtered. And the big, th the, you know, the industry is tightly controlled, but it's, it's very concentrated in the hands of a few, you know, the, the it's four companies, they control about 80 to 90% of the slaughter in the country. And m importantly, it, it, in many respects, in processing animals and food, small is not necessarily beautiful. From food safety point of view, from efficiencies and kind of in scale, from animal welfare point of view, and from the ability to you know package and market and sale and utilize every part of the animal, which is a moral imperative if you're going to kill animals. The big guys do that well, and the small guys don't. There's been a lot of talk about mobile slaughter as a solution for small farmers, but they, they have to compost much of the animal that the big guys turn into food for human consumption or some, you know, important use in the food chain. That's bad to me because that, that really... Uh, is contrary to the moral imperative. If, if you're raising an animal, you're going to kill that animal to convert it to food for human consumption, and you are obligated in that equation to use every part of that animal to, in the highest and best way. Okay, so there's a lot of 
uh, cultures that thrive. Uh, you know, fortunately, our country is diverse enough now that some people like liver, some people like filet mignon, some people blah, blah, blah. So every part of the animal has a customer, but uh, the big guys are able to, to accomplish that. And from an animal welfare point of view, because the industry finally has uh, embraced the notion that, you know, if you treat an animal well and calmly and with respect and dignity prior to slaughter, the meat's better, okay? So there's, and therefore they make more money. So, so they understand that now. So they've put systems in that really address animals in big modern slaughterhouses don't freak out like they do in smaller dungeon-like undercapitalized older operations, which I don't know if you've ever been in a slaughterhouse. They're not great places, but if, if you do kill animals and you're, it, that's part of your life, and you, when you visit a well-run slaughterhouse, you feel a lot better about it. But the big guys do it better from animal welfare, better from, for food safety, and they do it cheaply because they can make money off every part of the animal. And if you're driven by, as we talked earlier, about uh, equal access to great animal-based foods, you do need to take costs out between the farm and the plate. And the big, the really big one is in the, in the processing. You know, most of the EU, they film every stunning, there's, there's continuous camera in throughout the slaughterhouse. Every stunning, every final killing of an animal is videotaped or digital, digitized. Somewhere. And there are plants in this country that are doing that now, and it is definitely a movement of the future. And I think we'll see a lot of uh, controlling the uh, this treatment of animals at that location. Well, if I was a good farmer, I would want that. Animals are raised in buildings. Nobody knows what's going on in there. I think that, that if, if thoughtful farmers wanted people to see what they're doing, and uh, which would be a positive for them. I, and I think because, uh, and, and more and more as we see this as humane brand claim, people to see what they're doing, you know, that and whatnot, which are not as robust as they should be. But if, if you wanted to have a certified humane or humanely raised uh, uh, third-party verification on your meat, why don't they include 24-hour cameras in the buildings? so that the public can actually, if not the public, at least their auditors, could take a look at what's going on at any time they want to. And that would be you know, a prerequisite to certifying them as humane. I think that would be a good start. Well, of course, on, a, on, a, you know, on having permanent pastures, and animals grazing on it, it's hard to be more regenerative than that. So, it, and, uh, and that was a kind of a classic model, even on the croplands of the Midwest, where you'd have a four year cycle where you'd grow corn one year, soybean the next year, then you'd plant alfalfa or, or clover, permanent pasture, and graze animals on it. That was regenerative agriculture because you were actually improving your soil. So, when what the talk about sustainable is really maintaining status quo, but when you when you when you're stewarding land, you're supposed to regenerate soil and make that ground more productive for future generations, not just to maintain the status quo. If we stopped raising corn and soybean to feed and other cereal crops to feed to cattle, and followed the way of other pastoral nations, you know, southern from Argentina to New Zealand, Tasmania, South Africa. These are countries that are pastoral and raise grazing animals and allow the animals to harvest naturally occurring cellulose material, plants. So they don't plow, plant, till, store, harvest, uh, transport the concentrated energy of the plant to a 
livestock confinement facility, a fila, a bifila, to feed the animals. They let the animals do that. That can't be industrialized, okay? But, but that is a very regenerative uh, methodology. In North America, we feed grain to cattle because we can. So we have been blessed, Canada and, and the United States, has been blessed with all this topsoil, right? So, and it's so much easier to put a whole bunch of cattle in one place, and plow and plant the corn and soybean, externalize all the costs to the environment, right? And with the fertilizer and destroying the, our nation's greatest resource, the natural topsoil. It's so much easier to run a business and, and do it that way than it is to have the animals on the grass harvesting it themselves and have this much more decentralized model where you have large herbivores all over the landscape, which is a historic model, whether it was the buffalo or the elk in the West and, or even early farmers. You know, so converting naturally occurring cellulose material that sequesters carbon into the soil and solve a lot of our most, it's been alleged all of our environmental challenges that flow from carbon dioxide and produce great food that without torturing the animals, without torturing the environment, arguably better nutritionally, certainly better for the animals to be driven by nature. But all we need to do is think of, we need to eat, begin to eat beef. If you want to eat grass-fed beef, you have to eat it seasonally or frozen. Fortunately, we have that technology. Or you have this kind of relationship with the Southern Hemisphere, which has a complementary season. So their regenerative practices, our regenerative practices, Eat when it's best in season, just like you would a stone fruit or blueberries. Or that's the world we live in today, and and you could uh, solve a huge amount of the carbon dioxide overproduction in our in our society. I'm not suggesting that we abandon all the technology and and the. Uh, the tools that are there. I don't think we could get back to those days. I mean, communities have disappeared. The intellectual capital has is, is, is dwindled. What I do find hope in, though, and hopefully it's not naive, is that there are a lot of, uh, uh, there's so much interest in food. It's one of the, say it's the great central experience that nobody can take away from you. Small family farms are not going to feed uh, our country. Uh, but reasonably sized farms, sensibly sized farms, under thoughtful manage management and cooperative associations with other farms, can do that. I firmly believe it. I really think policymakers who have actually granted charters to USDA kill plants need to mandate that their their charter, their license to do business is, should be subject to opening their doors to uh, smaller operations. So they're the farmers in the middle who really can produce a lot of animals in a sensible way are, are the ones who are kind of caught between the, tyrant, the twins of oppression. The big guys don't want them. They want them out of business and the little guys can't handle it in a properly or well enough, I believe, and here we bring policymakers in that in, say, okay, Tyson, you have to do this if you're, want, otherwise we're going to take your license away to do business. You have to open your doors to reasonably scaled animal livestock operations and do a custom kill and return, which is the jargon. I want policymakers to tell the big guys they got to open their doors. Let's create a separate facility on those big campuses because they have the intellectual capital, they have the management talent, they have the know-how to run these kill plants in the best possible ways.